So I think it's fair to say that uh, cities have been the basis of civilization, beginning from ancient Rome and many of the other cities all over the world. They provide a focus for wealth creation, for scientific and for artistic creativity and for social interaction. At the same time, cities are home to high levels of income equality, um, or income inequality, of pollution, of crime and sickness, and they seem able to suffocate themselves on their own voracious demand for resources of all types. By virtue of their density, both of population and the built environment, cities tend to magnify and accelerate many of the resource-related challenges. Yet, they are also sites of innovation and innovative solutions to the challenges we face. The, oops, so one more. The challenge of dealing with resources more sustainably at an urban scale is relatively new, however. While much research has been going on on how entire economies have been using resources, the micro scale is more often addressed by looking at the resource performance of products, of companies, or buildings. Yet, this leaves out the city scale. Therefore, indeed, it is one of the grand challenges of looking at the resource-related challenges of cities. And what you see here is, well, historic site of London Bridge uh, and a fantastic app that has been created which is driven by data on the actual wealth creation but also the resource use of cities. And it might also draw your attention to a fantastic novel that has been written by Pulitzer uh, winning journalist Kathleen Booth who lived in the city of Mumbai for two years to learn more about the waste picking young people there who make a living out of uh, what I call it recycling. Um, so in total, um, urban areas currently account for some 60 to 80 percent of global energy production and also roughly the same amount of carbon emissions and resource use. The trend towards urbanization reflected in all corners of the world has been accompanied by increasing pressure on the environment and growing numbers of urban poor. And this movement towards cities is expected to continue in the coming decades with probably some 70 to 80 percent of the global population expected to reside in urban areas by 2050. So this pressure is likely to accelerate if the current trends continue. So the 21st century will be an urban century. Most of the growth will be occurring in the global south. By 2025, for example, most estimations are that Tokyo probably is still the biggest agglomeration in the world, but three cities in South Asia will be in the top five. The cities of Delhi, Mumbai, and Dhaka, uh, Dhaka each with more than 20 million inhabitants. For Dhaka, that would represent even a almost 50% of increase from today's levels. And like Dhaka, many of those megacities tend to be located in deltas, in river deltas, which means that they occupy fertile land, fertile soil, which means there is a conflict between agriculture and those urbanization trends in many parts of the world. So it's, um, one could state that urban growth is occurring in the places which are most vulnerable to and least able to cope with environmental challenges. Um, at the same time, uh, in addition to taking available cropland out of production, the sheer magnitude of today's cities means that local water supplies rarely can suffice. Water transfers or moving water long distances to population center is becoming a major source of contention in places such as Hibarayabad, uh, Orzana, Yemen, a capital which is likely to be uh, moved towards other places because the city is basically running out of water. Uh, and it's not much better in a city like Johannesburg in South Africa, which also has no major water supply from nature itself. 
So there is this direct competition, as I said, between urban consumption and agricultural consumption, and it's one of the fascinating topics uh, 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 today in many of the papers that we look forward to share with you. So uh, at the same time, we realize that there are threats to those cities, because many of those cities, including places like Rotterdam in the Netherlands, will be some of the most vulnerable places to sea level rise. Uh, with a, a tripling of the population at risk from coastal flooding by the next, by, by 2070, and a tenfold increase in global GDP exposed to the risk. So cities are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. While cities are able to purchase standard commodities, the water infrastructure has not kept up with the pace of urbanization. In Jakarta, for instance, the unofficial estimation is that only one quarter of the population living in Jakarta has access to clean drinking water, uh, while a mere 2% is connected to sewer, which means that there are huge contamination issues in a city like uh, Jakarta, which reminds us, of course, to 19th century London, where this also has been a big issue, was called the the, the bacteriological cities, and when you look around here, if you are from London or like me myself, new to London, and see the news here, this is one of the ongoing issues of these days. Uh, so the kind of question of how water infrastructures can be rebuilt in order to become greener while at the same time meeting the demands of the population is actually quite topical. But what is behind it? Uh, can be called the resource nexus. The tradition in research is to look at single resources, right? This is how all of us have been trained, to look either at water or at energy or at single commodities. If you're a specialist in a certain metal, you're great in that area. But what is at stake is to look at the nexus, the interrelations between the use of the different resources. You can hardly use any resource without making use of any others, including land and water indeed. And we could also consider the case of cement production, which is the key material for building cities, for building urban <coughs> infrastructures, and consider how the biggest cement producer in the world, which is China these days, uh, organizes this process. You need a lot of energy to produce cement. It is, in fact, uh, the most energy intensive product of the world, an estimation is that some 15% of China's CO2 emissions come through the cement production process because uh, through the chemical characteristics, much CO2 is released through the burning of the clinkers. So this is uh, one of the issues, plus indeed it is a water intensive product. So whatever you do with uh, urban development, you need uh, construction materials, which today is cement, you need energy, you need water, which is diverted from food production, etc., etc. So acknowledging this resource nexus will provide a more integrated view, uh, will allow us to better understand resource-related questions that would be difficult to answer in the more traditional pillared or stovepipe approach. Without better knowledge, scarcities of, of different kinds are more likely to interrupt supply chains and reduce the resilience of long-standing mechanisms. So we will have to look at tools and we will have to develop tools that monitor, that measure, that assess the resource use of cities. And what you see on this slide here is the methodology which is called material flow analysis. It has been developed in the OECD context. It's probably the most comprehensive measurement tool to measure the uh, materials of different economies at this level, yet we see that water is not in, and it might also be a bit tricky to get all the information from what is called the hidden flows, the materials that usually are extracted in uh, remote areas of other parts of the world and then enter through the usual stages of production chains the, uh, uh, the premises of economies or cities. 
So looking forward at what tools can actually be developed and applied and will allow us also to model any future resource use of cities is one of the great red lines, <laughs> one of the great topics of our today's conference. The key question indeed is what kind of networked urban infrastructures will be built? Will cities be designed for a more sustainable socio-ecological metabolism or will they continue to draw down nature's resources and ecosystems? <coughs> will they reinforce the, say, techno-apartheid that is splittering cities around the world or will they create the basis for greater equity, reduced levels of poverty and greater opportunity opportunities to build a sense of community? Will more sustainable modes of resource use reinforce or undermine the search for greater equity and a sense of place? And will those infrastructure designs and investment take into account the changing nature of urbanization patterns in response to the rising cost and changing flow of resources through cities? These are the questions for researchers, while at the same time we realize that cities move on. There is a huge worldwide movement of low carbon cities. There are many people, there are many citizens, there are many architectures just trying to do it better. And uh, well, thanks to one of our PhD students, I could collect some of those uh, best practices and I'm pretty sure we will learn much more about what goes on in the different parts of the city movements worldwide. And indeed, it is also essential for research to learn how the real actors play, and then indeed give the, all the insight that researchers could do. Just to walk uh, very quickly through those um, examples, there is a great, say, socio-ecological food for recycling program in parts of Brazil. There are interesting transportation modes all around, including one in Medellin in Colombia, or the kind of foldable cars which have been under development at MIT. Think about London and parking spaces, so this sounds like a potential market opportunity indeed. There is a great process also going on, which is participatory budget formulation, where the local municipal government asks the people what the priorities should be. This doesn't sound very radical, right? Though in practice, this is uh, something which does not happen that often, so more transparency is a key as it is more participation of the cities on some of the critical choices that need to be made. Indeed also there is a huge movement of urban agriculture bringing ecosystems back in the city which is also part of a few papers here at the conference and there is the idea of redeveloping the water infrastructure not only here in London but also in other of the heavy industrialized parts of our world the picture I took here is from my home region, which is the Emscher, which is a, a part of Germany, which is more known for coal and steel production than it is for blue water and blue skies. Yet it has been transformed. It's not yet perfect. It's still very uh, resource intensive, but the whole region is on the move towards a more sustainable use of resources. So why are we here? I guess we have a number of common questions. Some of those might be more specific, some of those might be more radical, more general, more uh, research-driven, more practice-driven, but indeed the idea of uh, building more sustainable cities is probably what unites us here. Um, what is interesting at this conference, and I'm really grateful to Ian that he has mentioned the sort of strategic ideas that UCL has in developing the larger agenda of more of those symposia and also uh, trying to trigger some research with those kind of uh, seed money that you have mentioned. What we have done indeed is to ask for paper submissions and this is probably the core of our conference along the three sessions. But we also did some other ideas, so thanks to Catherine and Alison and the others, that we have had a, sh a sort of a contest and students of UCL and the, well, students in general produce short films and some posters which are exhibited here in the catering space. There will be a contest, so those students expect you to give your voice on what the best poster, the best film could be. 
and it depends on you whether we share the price or whether we say this is really outstanding or whatever. So we also will enjoy a film, a type of presentation um, uh, later on this afternoon where Charlotte Johnson has done a mapping of what goes on at UCL here. Uh, we will indeed have a keynote by Herbert Girardet uh, later on the afternoon and we will have some uh, what is called eco-action games during the reception. And I don't know much about it, I guess you don't know either, so probably this will be one of the fancy events. And indeed, what <laughs> is designed to wrap up and uh, look forward to the future research agenda is the panel tomorrow morning. Uh, and uh, well, I encourage you to stay, don't miss anything, and I look forward to a fascinating conference with you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>